Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to load these packages. Um, there's three standard library packages, date time, math, and time. Um, and then there's this third party package called pits that we're also going to load. Um, so yeah, and no, note that um, date time has been loaded as DT and time has been loaded as TM. Um, okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, um, so this is the, this, this, uh, section of the, um, of the tutorial is just noting that, um, the date time module, which is the one that we're importing here has a class called date time. Uh, so that's got a little bit confusing. Um, but what that means is that, so we imported this date time module and then we renamed it dt um okay so now um when we want to okay so just make sure i have this okay um so now when we want to uh excuse me So if we want to if we want to reference this uh, date time class, we're going to write dt dot date time, um, and I'll just show the help string for that. So uh, the date time it's a it's a the class it represents like a moment, um, a moment in like a date right um, in history, uh, up to a microsecond accuracy. So this, the first example we're going to do is we're going to build um, a date. We're going to call the date uh, pi second, um, which corresponds to pi day. Okay, so that's, uh, well, pi day in the year 2021. So the first argument is the year. And then I don't, if you're not, if you're not familiar with pi day, it's, uh, it's March 14th, which is 314, right? Um, and then, uh, the fourth argument is the hour. Um, and I guess, yeah, <laughs> if we want to fill out more digits in pi, we'll put in, um, nine seconds and 29 microseconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, that, uh, that builds the object. I guess it doesn't show anything by default. So we want to write print by seconds. We can look at it. Okay, so now we can see that it just shows the date time that we built with a nice string, um, 2021, March 14th, at uh, 015 hours, 9 minutes, uh, 26 seconds. Um, okay. Now, I guess we can also, um, there's also another another way to represent uh, time. So this is, a, this, this is a way of representing a time um, using a date. Um, with an hours, minutes, seconds. Another way to represent time is in seconds since January 1st, 1970, um, which is sort of a, it's kind of a funny way to measure time, but I guess 1970 was maybe the, the moment in which computers were able to measure time. So there's no point in having times before that. Um, <laughs> uh, so if you use this function tm.time, um then you get you get the current time and i think yeah it's going to keep changing so if you keep executing this cell um it's going to keep changing because of course time is progressing hmm. okay so um one useful thing that you can do uh with this kind of module is that you can measure the time it takes to do a certain computational task um so for example if we write, um, so t start, um, so if we, if, we if we write a line of code that records the time um, here, um, you know, and then we write, a, we write a line of code that records the time, uh, the time at a second moment, um, then I guess I'll just put this in. So then we're gonna say print, um, and 
minus start. Okay, so the time that elapsed between um, when I called, when we called this line and when we called this line is a very short amount of time, just uh, 39 microseconds. Um, but if we put a little command in here that causes us to stop, oh, what did I do wrong? That should be, oh, sorry. Okay, now you can see that um, the time that's elapsed since um, the end and the start is going to be half a second. Um, so that's a, that's if you're writing code that is um, takes a while to run and you're interested in speeding it up, this is a useful way to measure uh, how long it takes to execute the code. So then you can, you know, um, when you speed when you when you do something that makes the code run faster, um, you can observe it. Uh, using this method. You can also, there's also, um, you know, this the, the note here says that there's also a module called time it, um, which can do this more accurately. Um, but in essence, I think the point is just to give you an introduction to the fact that you can extract um, the current time. Okay. Um, so, right. So this is just a comment about what Unix time is. Okay, so let's move on to the date time module. Um, this prevents time in a more human interpretable format. So the Unix time is just seconds since January 1st, 1970, which, you know, it ends up being these huge numbers, which are not, it's hard to say what, you know, that this, this number corresponds to August 2nd, 2023, et cetera. Um, so that's why it's useful. That's why that's why this date time format is a little bit more useful um, uh, for humans. Okay, so so next. We're just going to illustrate um, printing the time. Oh, let's hope that pi second is pi second still there. Yeah. Okay. So if we remember, we made this object called pi second, which represents um, which represents uh, the time this pi time. <laughs> um, and. Uh, this this pi second is an it's a so, so, so sorry this pi second is a um an instance of a date time class and this class comes with some useful functions for printing it in a nice way so that's what we're going to show here um, uh, so we can use that we can use this uh, method string format time or str ft time. Uh, Um, so yeah, I guess if we use this, uh, and let's see, this is, so this, um, this function, I second, oh, it doesn't say exactly how to, well, maybe we can experiment with a different format. Yeah. Okay. So. So I guess this just gives you the ability to print uh, pretty dates. Um, just do another example. Yeah. Okay. okay so the next example um, is to show how to read and write dates and times. So, um, this is kind of a cool example where we're going to analyze um, lightning data. Um, and so I, we're given the data, we're given the data in this, it's, it, it, this is example is um, showing you what would occur if we were given data in a text format. 
um, and we want to parse this into a we want to parse this string into a date time object. Um, okay, so let's start. I'm going to start with this string. Okay, so we start with this. Um, so say that we're given this uh, string, and we'd like to um, parse that and build a daytime object from it. Um, so to do that, we can use this uh, function. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it actually. Dt datetime str strip time maybe it stands for. Um, oh, did I spell that wrong? No, no, let's see if it works. Um, so, and so this, so the string has this format, um, months, days, years. Okay, so um, I'm going to write oops. Oh, that's why we couldn't find it. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I was trying to look at, I wanted to look at the uh, help string. It's always good. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, so, um, so, so given this string, we built um, a daytime object strike time and just to look at it, make sure that this did the right thing. Okay, so this would this would be useful if say that you had data in a file. Um, you could read in F and 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 and, a, and a, you had a time series. So you had you had um, a date and then some data next to the date. You can use this object to programmatically read in um, all the data with the dates attached. <laughs> yeah, so that's what. Why do we bother doing this? Um, <laughs> I guess, that, yeah, so the point is that you might, when you're given data that has a timestamp, um, you might get this timestamp could take many different formats. So the utility of this um, daytime object is that you can parse data with many different formats, right? Okay. So yeah, so the next the next challenge is to is to parse this string. Um, so let's try that. Um, or let's see, it's going to be strike hour. Okay. Um, and so the question is, are we able to? So how would we parse this one? Um, Oh, I'm sorry. This challenge is this the the example is showing you how to print. Um, so I'll show you what. The the example is is sorry. I misread the the uh, the example. They they were trying to show you how to print. Um, the objective is to be able to print the. Okay, so let's see. Print strike time. Okay, so the strike this date time it's 2007 June 27th. Um, hour 16 minute 18 second 21 and so the objective is can we print a string um, that looks like this and uh, the answer is yes we just have to format it in a special way um, and that format what it's going to do is it's gonna, we're going to print the hour followed by a small h and then we're going to print the minute followed by a small m and then the second small by fall followed by a small s. Um, and if we do that, we obtain this objective. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, another useful thing you can do, I guess, is um, 
you can query, you can get the year. Oh, it's actually easier if it's in another box. Um, yeah, you can get the year. I think you can also get, let's see if this works, day. Oh, no, day. Um, so, so the year, um, well, let's see, hour. Right, so the hour was 16 here, the minute, 18, and the second, 21. Um, so that's helpful. Okay, and then we didn't even, they didn't, we didn't yet demonstrate this function, but there's also a function to obtain the current time, um, which is um, called DT date time now. Um, so you look at now, here, that's interesting actually. Um, so, so now, you know, the, now is a date time, which represents the current time and we can figure out, uh, oh yeah. Um, yeah, so one, 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 uh, one fun exercise would be to figure out how much time is left in this tutorial um, using the date time module. <laughs> um, so that could be done and DT date time. Well, let's see. Do that as an exercise. So it's going to be 2023, August 8th, day two, hour 16, zero. And then, so what's going to happen if we say n minus now, 32 minutes left? Okay. Um, and if we wanted to get just the minutes, oops, minute. I don't know, what is this? Min. Okay, sorry. So to get the minute, we write min. Um, and that didn't work. Oh, this is, sorry, I'm doing it wrong. Okay. Um, I see. Okay, I was confused because this is actually the time delta. Okay. Somehow it just has a days though, no? Um, hmm. it looks like the, the, uh, the example is broken. Um, but anyways, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. I'm actually not sure why that is the case. Maybe this time Delta class has changed since the examples put together. Let's move on. Um, okay. So the next, um, the next example is to um, look at data that pertains to coastal tides during a tropical cyclone. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's just hmm. The example is broken, and I don't know how to fix that. Oh, I see what happened. Import date time STT. Okay. I messed that up because I. I overwrote this, um, the module DT. Okay. Okay, so let's just put that code in there and then we'll go through the um, various things that you can print. Okay. So actually, no, I'm going to do, do it this way. Okay, so the high tide, um, no, let's go start from the beginning. Okay, so first we're going to define high tide, um, which is the moment of high tide, and that's going to be 2016, June 1st, hour 4, minute 38. Um, 
Next, we're going to define um, an object that represents the length of the lunar day. And this, so the lunar day can't be represented with a date. It's represented by the distance between two dates. Um, and so to represent the distance between two dates, we use this object time delta. Um, and so the, the, the lunar day is 24 hours, 50 minutes long, right? Um, and so we defined our lunar day that way. Um, and let's see if we lunar day. Oh, I'll let this out. Okay, so we print lunar day and it says one day, 50 minutes. That's because the, um, the moon is rotating around the earth, even as the earth is spinning as well, right? Okay, so um, now uh, you may or may not know that um, there are two ties per day. Um, so basically, there's so the high tide is going to occur two times in a single lunar day, um, and that means that um, the tide duration is a quarter of a lunar day. So the tide duration that we're going to define is the distance between high tide and low tide. Um, Okay, so we can do math on the time delta to compute the tide duration from the lunar day. And yeah, you see it comes out to be around six hours, which is a quarter of a day. So um, now that we know the tide duration, we can compute the next low tide, which is gonna be the high tide plus the tide duration. And then I'm gonna print that. Let's see. Okay, so the next low tides, ooh, yeah, right. It's gonna be, okay, wait, let's print um, high tide. Okay, so high tide is occurring at um, 0400, and then the next low tide is occurring at, um, at 10 hour, at 10 a.m., right? Um, and then the, the example does goes further and we're gonna compute next high tide, which is gonna be next low tide plus tide duration again. Um, and then in terms of that, then we were able to compute the length of the tide, which is next high tide minus high tide. And as I was saying, um, the tide length, it's going to be half the duration of the lunar day. So 12 hours, 25 minutes, that's how long. Um, that's, the, that's the distance between two, um, between the two peaks of the lunar tide. Uh, hmm? Is there a question? Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe if you can mute yourself. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay. So now the, the, the next part of the tutorial goes over um, time zones. Um, and so um, first we're gonna build a, time, a daytime object that's naive. Um, oops, date. So the naive, the naive, uh, the naive daytime is the one that we've been working with. Um, if we just get the now, then it's going to be August eighth, three thirty four. Um, but we can also extract a time, a date time that's time zone aware. So um, this would be useful. For example, if I passed, if I passed this date time to, um, to someone in Ghana, um, then it would suddenly be incorrect because, or, well, no, actually, sorry, it would be correct. Never mind. <laughs> um, there we go. Okay. Um, it would be out of context because we wouldn't know uh, what time zone it was referring to, right? Um, so now that I've put uh, uh, this time zone argument into it, um, we're indicating that 
this time is in fact zero offset from UTC, which I think is Ghana time actually. Mm. Okay. Um, so now we can do the, an interesting example where we use that um, pi pits or pi time zone module. Um, and they'd have an example. I don't know if the people from Pythia live in US mountain time, but um, let's see what it says. Okay. So, um, okay, so that's cool. So mountain time. Okay, so mountain time. So in US mountain time, um, it's actually 9 a.m. Whereas, um, let's see if you have to know, I guess now we need to know the names of the time zones and I don't know them all, but let's just see if this works. Um, oops. So US Eastern time, which is where I am, it's 1136. Hmm. Okay. So we just did. Okay. Hmm. So now the next uh, the next example, we're gonna we're gonna learn how to convert time from one time zone to another. Um, so. Okay, so, so let's let's see what happens if we let's just do it this way. Okay, so if we build this time UTC, um, which is U, which is the data, which is um, I guess this is again UTC zero. Um, and then we can, re we're going to replace, oops, that's how it was written. Yeah. Um, we'll replace, or we're going to replace the time zone info um, with this pits UTC object. Um, and so let's see. Right. So now if we want to print UTC in a different time zone, oh, did it not work? Okay. Okay. So now if we want to print the UTC object in a different time zone, um, first we can build build a time zone object using pits time zone. Um, so I'm going to build, why don't I do Eastern just to have something different. Um, okay. So let's just make sure we got this Eastern time zone object correct. Okay. Um, And then to print UTC in Eastern time zone, I don't know why they call it NY in this example, but we use this function as time zone and we put in Eastern time zone. And now I'll say print. Okay, so um, the first print message prints this one out, which is a time zone in Ghana or UTC zero. And then the second message um, prints out the time um, in UTC minus four, which is Eastern time, and that's um, 1139. Okay. Mm. Okay, so hopefully that was kind of a comprehensive introduction um, to uh, date times. Um, I think like the main thing, the main thing to um, grasp is that uh, representing time is could, might be more difficult than you think, um, and that's why this date time object proves useful. Um, because the only other way that we have to represent time is in seconds since some epoch or a particular date, um, but then humans can't interpret that. Um, um, so and there's all these tools: time, the time module, the date time module, and this pi time zone module um, that are useful for manipulating dates. Okay, so now let's go on to, um, with the remaining time that we have, um, go on to data formats.
Um, and this is going to be a short introduction, I guess, to NetCDF, um, which is a very useful format for storing data. Okay, so um, NetCDF, and I maybe I'll just go down to the import. So NetCDF, which we're going to, NetCDF is a, is a, is software. Um, it's a it's a uh, convention uh, for storing data. Um, and you can write and read NetCDF in many programming languages. Uh, in Python, to interact with NetCDF data sets, we use this uh, function, uh, NetCDF, uh, sorry, this module, NetCDF4, OK? Um, and so if you, if you download, it, oftentimes when you obtain geospatial data, um, you're going to be, you're going to be uh, getting that in the form of a NetCDF data set. Uh, just give me a second. I'm going to pull it up on my phone here. Okay. Okay, so let's start the module by importing all these things. Hmm. Um, okay, so the first example that we're going to do is we're going to we're going to actually um, show how to build a data set. Okay, so um, in order to do that, we need so what 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 our our data is going to represent um, like for something like temperature, which is going to have a horizontal position like latitude, longitude. Um, we'll have a vertical coordinate, which in this case is going to be pressure, um, and then we have we have times that it occurs, right? So these are there's four dimensions to our data. Um, so I'll just create this data because this is kind of this is the boring part. Um, we're just creating. So what these lines do is they create. Um, it creates a start time. Um, then uh, this here actually maybe I should show this. Let me show. Okay, so um, first we're going to create a start time, which um, will just be um, today, but at 22 hours. So that'll be late at night. Um, and then the next thing is we're going to create an array, a numpy array um, of times, which um, proceed from the start time um and um there's going to be 13 of them um for 13 hours after the start time okay so just to see what that show, show you what that looks like let's see i don't know if it's going to print well yeah okay cool okay so um in this array times um the first element is the 20 is 22 hour 22 the second element is hour 23 the third element is the next day, hour zero, uh, and so on. Okay. Um, now, so we have so we have this um, this uh, array representing the times at which we'll have data, um, and then the next thing to do is to build two arrays representing um, horizontal coordinates. So we'll have an x, which um, is going to be a latitude. Um, so that just goes from minus 150 to 150 in every three degrees. Um, and then we'll have a Y, which is going to be, I'm um, sorry, X is longitude, Y is latitude. So X is going east-west, Y is going north-south. Um, and this Y is going from, oh, that can't be true. <laughs> Did I get that wrong? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. It's every three kilometers. Okay, so these are distances, 100 kilometers, 100 kilometers. Um, minus 150 kilometers, 153 kilometers. Uh, sorry for misspeaking. And then finally, um, we're going to have an array of pressures, um, which we're going to call press. Okay. So next, um, we'll create um, our just just for the sake of creating random data. Um, we'll create. Um, this is going to be a four dimensional array. So let's see what happens if we try to print that. Yeah, it's going to look kind of confusing. Um, so temps is an array um, that uh, the first dimension has time. So if you look at the let's see, look at the um, shape of the temps. So this this is a four dimensional array that's thirteen times by seven uh, vertical levels or pressure levels. 
by 67 um, levels in Y and, uh, sorry, you know, points in Y and 101 points in X. Okay, so um, I could plot it, but um, maybe we should just keep going. Um, okay, so, you know, yeah, it's just dummy data, basically. Um, and so then the next step, so this 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 data set, it represents data on a grid. And the whole point of NetCDF is to provide a convention um, for storing all that data so that when you read it back, um, you you're you're able to interpret the fact that um, this first dimension is times, et cetera. Um, so to create that, we first we uh, we create a data set here. Um, and the let's maybe I should type this part out. Um, so let's see how to, okay. So if we look at the doc string for data set, um, we find, let's see, does it have a, if it doesn't have an example, we'll just have to go into it. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the syntax for creating a data set is uh, first the first argument is going to be the name of the file. So here we're going to call it forecast model dot nc. We, we always use the um, the la the the dot nc indicates that the file is a netcdf file. Um, this w command indicates that we would like to write to the file. Um, so I think if we put r, that indicates that we're only interested in reading from the file and we're not going to modify the file's contents. That's useful um, if you if you if you have data that was, for example, hard to collect, and you don't you want to ensure that when you write code, you're not going to change it. Um, you should always read from it um, using the R. Um, oh, someone's asking, uh, can I share the NetCDF folder in the lab? Yes. Um, so the NetCDF folder is going to be in um, core. So sorry, let's go back. Um, okay, so we go to uh, this the top level folder questing python 2023 um and then we go to pythia foundations questing and then we click on core um and then click on data formats so let me just i'll just type that in the chat um okay so Or okay. Okay. So um, yeah, so as I was saying, um, this W, this W um, argument indicates that we're interested in writing to the file rather than reading from it. Um, next, we're going to specify the format, which for that, we're just going to use um, NetCDF, the classic format for NetCDF4. Um, then I believe that diskless means that um, we're not actually going to save the file to disk. That's just useful for this example. I think in the in ordinary case, you would not want to use the diskless format. Um, okay, so we create that. Oh. Have a okay. error somewhere. I'm not sure where. Oh. <laughs> Permission denied. Um. Hmm. That's interesting. Because I did say discless equals true. Maybe that's actually because, let me see. Okay, 
Okay, I see. So if you try to if you try to execute this line twice, then it's going to give you permission denied because you have to change the name. So okay, <laughs> so I changed the name to forecast model two, and it worked. Hmm. Yeah. So this is the this is the so just be careful if you're reading if you'd like to read a data set, you don't use the W, you use R. Um, if you would like to read and write from a data set, then you use A. Hmm. Okay, so we have, we created this um, object called NC, right? So let's see what that looks like now. Okay, so it's this is it's an empty data set and it has no dimensions, variables, or groups. Um, and so the the nice thing about NetCDF is that we have a way of adding all of these this metadata about the data. This so that when you give someone a NetCDF data set, it should be like self-contained. It contains all the documentation that's needed to uh, understand the data, plot it, um, and make sense of it. Um, so, you know, we'll we'll add our um, we'll add our metadata to this empty file now. Um, that's gonna we're gonna be using um, we're gonna tell the people reading this file that we're using CF conventions. Um, we'll give the file a title, which is, you know, in this case, it's kind of the weather forecast, right? It created random temperature data. Um, <laughs> uh, if you want, you can add the institution that you're working at when you manipulated the data. Unit data in this case is uh, the institution that develops that CDF. Um, you can indicate the source of the data. So, um, here we're pretending that the source of our data is this piece of software called WRF. Um, oops, let me see history. Um, what is this going to be? String. Let's see what that looks like. Um, nice. Okay, yeah. So I think you can, yeah. So um i guess the history this history are uh, with the, with the history we're just trying to say that um the data set was created at this time using python okay um and i don't think we don't need to put anything in the references or the comment um i guess references would be if you were going to reference a paper or something like that Hmm. Okay. Um, so if so if you remember we had this um temperature data set, which is a three-dimensional, four-dimensional data set with times, pressure, um, y and x. Um, and so next what we want to do is we want to we want to add those dimensions to the net CDF file. So for that to add a dimension, we're going to use this create dimensions function. Um yeah, let's see. We'll do um first we'll add the times and we're gonna set we're gonna set the forecast time as none. I think we're gonna th that means that the dimension is unlimited, so we could add as many entries as we want. Um of course the data that we created only has 13 times, so we'll get to that later. Um I think it's often the case that you want to have an unlimited time dimension if you don't know how many how many uh time points you're gonna end up with. Oh, we have a chat. Okay, yeah. Okay, so the x dimensions. So let's look at this x dot size. Okay, so we have 101 points in x. So, um, and so we'll create an x dimension with 101 points. Um, same same thing for the y dimension. And notice it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Oh, let's actually let's see. What oh, ah, uh, we can't we can't execute these things more than once. Okay. So sorry, I'm just going to execute these lines one at a time. Okay, great. So you, you see, as we're as we're adding the dimensions, um, it's uh, listing them here. And this is saying that there's an X dimension with 101 points and a Y dimension with 67 points, a time with zero, um, with zero points because it's unlimited. Um, and then finally, we're gonna add the pressure dimension.
Okay, and that's going to have seven points. Nice. Um, and I think. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how actually how to create that. Let's see what. Um, I'm not sure how to how to how to get this view of it, but maybe if we use print, let's see. No. Anyways, that's not so important. Okay. Um, okay, so we have we so the netcf file now has um, it has attributes, so it has like a description, a human readable description of the data, um, and it has uh, dimensions. So it has four dimensions: time, x, y, and pressure. And so the next thing that we can do is we can create a variable um, that represents the data in the netcdf data set. Um, so to do that, we use this create variable. Okay, and and then we're gonna so we're gonna put in, oops, let's do this. Um, we put we, every. This is one of the useful things about NetCDF. A, a variable is essentially an array of data, um, which hat which varies along every dimension in the NetCDF data set. But you can also attach a name to it, right? Um, so now we're gonna we're storing this. Um, we're storing. We're telling it that this variable is gonna represent temperature. Um, we're going to use a single precision floating point to store it, um, and we can indicate the dimensions that it depends on. Um, so if we, let's see, um, just remind us what the size is. Uh, temps dot shape. Okay, so it varies along um, time, pressure. And uh, the 67, if you remember, 67 is the um, 67 is the y dimension and 101 is the x dimension. Okay, so um, so in order to, to write that into here, we're going to say that and it this it matters the order that you write this in. Um, that's why I was checking. Um, forecast time. Sure. Okay. Okay, so that creates a net CDF variable. Let's look at it. Um, okay, so it's a net CDF variable um, that is using single precision. It's called temperature, it depends on the time, the pressure, y, x. And um, we're noting that uh, the forecast time is an unlimited dimension. So um, the shape is, since it's unlimited, we don't know how many times we're going to have. Um, okay, so then the exciting part, it's very subtle, um, but the exciting part is to actually save the data to file. And to do that, um, we simply write this line, right? And so now let's look at. Okay. So now when we look at the temperature, um, we see that it has a shape of 13, 7, 67, 101. Um, and, and, and so so the data, the data is inside the file now. Um, and if we weren't using the disk list format, then it would be saved to disk. And when we close the data set, um, now we have um, data that we can send to someone else. Okay, so let's see. Um, right, that's not so. We're we're out of time. So let me just see if um, there's anything more that we should do. Okay, well this I guess this is interesting. So um, another thing that we can do is we can fill in. So we we added global attributes to the whole file. Um, but we can also add attributes um, to each variable, right? So look at temps var. Um, okay, so temps var. Sorry. If we look at temps var, I mean, 
we know that there's a time pressure y x, but we don't have. There's nothing to indicate what the units are, whether they're Fahrenheit, Kelvin, Celsius, etc. Um, so we can add those um, names as attributes. For example, add these units, Kelvin, and then let's see if it's this place. Yeah. So when we add the attributes, um, they show up. Um, they're viewable inside the file. So the standard name is like what's the, what's the standard variable name um, in code um, that you'd like to use, and then we can also define a long name, which is basically how you would say this if you were to say it out loud. How do you, how do you call this variable? Um, this is sort of a funny thing, but you can add so. Um, you can add like if 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 a temperature value is missing, for example, if a sensor malfunctioned, um, we can add an indication that we're going to fill it up with this value minus nine 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 nine. Um, okay. Oops. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, I think yeah. So that now we're we're out of time. Um, so. Um, but I think we got part of the way through the the net CDF thing, so that's kind of that's kind of nice. Um, I definitely recommend going through the rest of this um, tutorial um, because you're going to get to plotting and um, well, you could attempt to do plotting anyways, um, and you can you know you get to you get to see how we add uh, how we add attributes to the to, to the to additional variables like a variable representing time or representing the coordinates, um, for example. Um, okay, are there any questions about what we went over? Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's no questions, then I'll stop the recording.